Okay, we, we know two parts about designing lands. We know something about the topology and the trade-offs between how do we arrange the, the nodes. And we briefly mentioned the different transmission media. In fact, we've spent before the midterm a whole topic on different transmission media. So different topologies are available, different transmission media. We noted with some of the topologies which topologies are, provide a shared medium? Uh, which, which topologies provide a shared medium? A shared medium. Shared. Link topology. That is, we share the medium amongst multiple users. Which, which of uh, that wasn't one of the topologies of our land topologies. Multiplexing is something more about a single link. A bus topology is a shared medium. Any others? Yep. Any of the others? Star in, a spe in some cases. When we used, actually we haven't spoken about it, sorry I'm thinking about IT, but yes in some cases a star is a shared, shared medium. That is, so a shared medium is when one transmits, the signal goes to all, to, to multiple receivers. It's a point to multi-point medium. A mesh is not a shared medium. With a mesh we just have point to point links between each station. If one transmits, only one other station receives. The problem with a shared medium is that we can get interference. In particular, if two transmit, then at the same time that results in a problem at the receiver. What's another example of a shared medium? Think about transmission media. Uh, yeah. Uh, not 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 always. Normally, with optical fiber, we just use a point-to-point -point link. We connect from one transmitter to one receiver. We transmit on one, and only one receives. No. What transmission media media is a shared medium? Twisted pair. No, we connect from one computer to another. With that pair is trans. Just it's a point-to-point -point link. The wireless. wireless. Wireless in general is a shared medium. Coaxial, sometimes, uh, we, because we use it as a bus, but in particular wireless. That's a very obvious example because with wireless we transmit, there's one transmitter, and normally with wireless, especially ha we have an antenna which disperses the signal, the signal is received by multiple receivers. So this is a point to multi-point communications. The problem that arises is if two people transmit at the same time, then at one receiver it will receive two signals. And those signals can interfere with each other. And the receiver cannot decode any of the data that was transmitted. The same arises in our shared topologies, our topologies with shared mediums. If two stations transmit at the same time, they send, if we have a bus, they send their, their signal across the medium and if someone else transmits at the same time, they transmit their signal. Those signals interfere with each other and the receiver cannot decode the data in either of those signals. That's a problem. If a shared medium if two or more stations transmit at the same time, then there's a chance that two transmissions will interfere with each other. And when we talk about transmitting signals, we can talk about interference. But if we look at frames, and we talk, okay, a frame is in fact a, a sequence of bits, 
which is made up of transmitting signals. But if we talk about frames, if two frames are transmitted at the same time, we say that there's a collision of frames. Those frames collide with each other at the receiver. And the normal assumption, if two frames are transmitted at the same time, or if a receiver receives two or more frames overlapping in time, either fully or just partially, then we normally assume that all frames are corrupted or lost. That is, the receiver cannot understand any of those frames. So if we transmit some frame with some header and data, some node A transmits that frame across a, a link and another node B, so this is at time zero and it takes 1,000 time units, but midway through B starts transmitting a frame with some different data. If C receives the transmissions from both of those frames, because the frames are partially overlapping in time, we'll assume that C cannot understand either of those frames. It's as if C receives random bits. It cannot decode what the original data was. We have corruption of the data at the receiver. So if two transmit frames partially overlapping in time, then a receiver cannot understand either of those frames. We get bit errors and we lose the data. We don't want that to happen. We would need to do retransmissions if that happens and retransmissions take time. So we want to avoid this scenario. And that's where we have some mechanism that controls who accesses the medium, who transmits with the goal that we want only one station to transmit at a time. Because if only one station transmits, then there's no chance of a collision. Mm -hmm. So medium access control is about controlling who accesses or who transmits on the medium at what time. Let only one send at a time, yeah. But we, we need to implement this in some protocol so that each of the nodes will follow some rules such that overall only one of them is transmitting at some time. So we, there are different techniques for doing this, different MAC techniques. The idea is to give stations opportunities to transmit. Stations want to send data. We think of the data in terms of frames. So a station may want to send 1,000 frames, as may some other stations. A MAC technique should give those stations chances to transmit those frames. But it should be fair and efficient. Fair means that, okay, we have two stations that want to transmit. They both want to send a thousand frames. If the system allows this one to transmit 1,000 frames and this one one frame, that would be unfair on this station. Fair means that we should give all stations equal opportunity to transmit. So we'd like to be fair amongst stations and efficient. That is, we want to allow the stations to get their data through to be transmitted. It's no good if I say, okay, every one hour you can transmit one frame. That's very inefficient from, your, from that station's perspective. So there are different techniques for doing this. And we're going to just illustrate some of them quickly uh, efficiency in terms of okay we'd ideally we'd like someone to be transmitting all the time so To illustrate the fairness and efficiency, <laughs> and we'll show this one in a moment. And you can see the pattern. If we have three stations and our medium access control gives each of the stations opportunities to transmit. So this is the transmission of a frame. 
A transmits a frame and then B and then C, A, B, C, A, B, C. This scheme would be fair because everyone gets an opportunity and they get equal opportunity to transmit and it would be efficient because if we look at the entire point of time, there's always someone transmitting. That is, there's a node transmitting and then another node. In terms of our shared medium, there's, it's always being used. This is fair and efficient. Fair because everyone gets an equal chance to transmit their data. Yeah, efficient because our one medium is always being used. Someone's always transmitting on that medium. This one is efficient because there's always someone transmitting on the medium, but it's unfair because A gets to transmit all the time, B and C don't get to transmit. And there's maybe not so good example. This would be fair but inefficient. Everyone gets an opportunity to transmit, but there's these periods of time when no one's transmitting. If we had such a protocol where that happened, we'd say the efficiency is worse than this because our medium is not being used in these periods of time. So we need a protocol such that the aim is to get it like this. We'll go through three examples or three or four examples to illustrate different approaches. There are others, but we'll just quickly go through them. Round robin reservation and random access. And we need one, two, three, four volunteers. One, two, three, four. Come to the front. Quick. Hurry up. No, four's enough. We only have four stations. Come to the front. One, two, three, four. These are our four stations. Okay? Four stations. They they want to transmit data. They want to transmit their, their data. Their data is... You want him on the red one. No, no, this is correct. You want the red one. Oh, no, this is okay. <laughs> this, their data, your data that you want to send is your name, okay? They're going to transmit their, the data. They have a large piece of data. It's their name. They're going to transmit by saying their name to everyone so we can all hear. But... They're going to break it into frames. In each frame, they can only transmit one letter. So in fact, you're going to transmit by saying the first letter, and then the second letter of your name, and then the third letter, and so on, so that you finally transmit your name. And we want a scheme such that we have a shared medium. If two of them transmit at the same time, there's a collision. That is, we will not be able to understand what they're saying. First approach, round robin. Round robin means taking turns. So, first approach, and there are different ways to control who transmits. First, we'll try a centralized approach. I will be the central device, so some special device in the network, and I will control who transmits. So when I tell you, you can transmit one frame. You can transmit. You can transmit. So the first letter of your name, you can transmit, you can transmit, you can transmit, and we'll keep going. And that's simple. This is round robin, we take in turns, but it's a centralized approach in that there's a special device, me, that controls which one transmits. Then let's try. 
So go from your third letter onwards. Then what? T. 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 And let's say your name is finished, okay? What's, what's happening? In fact, don't say anything. You say something. You've got data to send. <laughs> this is inefficient because of the, we're wasting some time. I say you get to transmit. They have nothing to send. So that takes some time and so on. So when they have nothing to send, Using this approach, if some of the stations have data to send and others do not, then the system becomes inefficient because I still go and give them a chance to send, but if they have nothing, then that's a waste. So the process of me giving them the opportunity to send takes some time, and that's where the inefficiency arises in this approach. It's good if they all have an equal amount of data to send because they all get an opportunity and it's reasonably efficient, but it's bad if the amount of data that the stations want to send varies over time. So that's round robin in a centralized approach. Let's try it in a distributed approach. Let's form a topology. So that approach would be okay in a star topology. Maybe I was the, the central device in the star and they were all connected to me and I just sent them a special message to say you can transmit form a ring, a ring topology, okay? <laughs> and in a ring topology, they would have cables between each pair. So they would hold hands and that would be their ring. <laughs> so there's our ring topology. They're going to do round robin. This is going to be a token ring based approach. Here's the token. When you have the token, you can transmit one frame and then you pass the token on to the next station. So try. Let's see, your name's finished now. Your name's finished now. So keep going, everyone else. Everyone else is going. Your, no, your name, keep going. Again, we have this situation where we're giving everyone an opportunity to transmit, but if some of them have nothing to send, then it becomes inefficient. But this is distributed. There's no central device involved. It's just the stations themselves work out who transmits by passing this special token. The token can be, you send the token as part of the header in the frame. So it, it indicates who's the next station that is allowed to transmit. This is a token ring land. Okay, One more? we've got two more. <laughs> Reservation based. Let's try a centralized approach where the stations indicate to the central station how much data they want to send. You want to send both your names, but in the first reservation you'll tell me how many letters in your first name. And then I will allocate opportunities. Let's try. So the first stage is to perform some reservations. How many letters? Four. Three. 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 Four, three. Oh, that's not a good example, but okay. Oh, four, three, 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 fine. So now I'm the central node. I, they have re requested opportunities to transmit. I allocate them. I can have four. No, four, three. So they send a request. I do some scheduling algorithm and I say, okay, you will get, you can have two transmissions. You go, go. You can have two. You can have one. You can have three. You can have two. You can have one. You can have one. And you can have one. Oh, because I think you're finished. So in that case, they request based opportunities based upon the amount of data they want to send. In this case, the number of letters. I do some judgment like, okay, this station is le less important than the others. <laughs> and therefore, I give, why, him, why? I give him less opportunities. I may say, okay, this station gets 
two opportunities. They can transmit two frames. And then this one, this one can only transmit one frame. And then I may come back and give them an opportunity later. So in this case, <laughs> the stations request opportunities to transmit. Some central controller can allocate those opportunities based upon demand. And then they would need to repeat that process of request and allocate depending on more data wants to send. So I can give priority to Steve's computer and less priority to the students' computers, for example, in a, in a LAN. So this way you can give priority to particular stations. Last one, random access. Distributed. The rules each station follows. You want to transmit your la you want to transmit your name. If you hear someone else transmitting, then you will choose a random number between one and ten and wait that many seconds before you'll try to transmit the, the letter again. Go. All right, let's try a gift different way. Okay, let's add another rule. That one worked, but let's add a new rule. After you transmit one letter, you again have to wait some random time. You cannot go A, B, C all together. And shut your eyes. Shut my eyes? Yeah. No, shut your eyes now. Oh, And shut your eyes and start. Okay, there was a collision there. <laughs> Two people transmitted at the same time. Keep going. On to your last name. Last name? Yeah. not. This one is not following the rules. In that <laughs> you need to, after transmitting or after you hear someone else transmit, you need to wait a random amount of time. Oh, yeah, I will call him to say something. No, you need to. If someone else transmits, you pick a number between 1 and 10, randomly, and then wait that many seconds. One more time. One more time. Keep going. Start from the start. Okay, okay. They've finished. So they get to transmit their data in this scenario. It's fully distributed. There's no central controller. So they just follow their own rules. Sometimes there may be collisions. So there's still possibility of collisions in this case, that two of them send at the same time. And it can be inefficient because you say something and then you wait a random period of time. During that random period of time, maybe no one's transmitting. But it's generally fair because everyone's just transmitting randomly. On average, over a large period of time, they'll all get to transmit their data. So this is random access. And this is what's used in your wireless LAN. And what happens if they both on the same time? If they both transmit, then we need to retransmit. So we need to somehow detect that there was an error, and then you would try to transmit that letter again because the receiver did not receive it. Thank our volunteers. That's our example. In, in the round robin, we showed both a centralized approach and a distributed approach. It depends on what network or what do you want. Do you have a central device in your network? Well, the, in the central approach, the central device tell, can tell which stations when to transmit. The stations may not know how many other stations are in the network. Oh, how many wow. Yeah, so how long do you wait? So in a central but, but approach... The after send and after next node, you send something like that. In the distributed, we need somehow to tell the next station you have a chance to send. There are others. So there are variations, but they are just some examples of how do you, 
how do the stations control such that only one sends at a time? And there's trade-offs in terms of fairness, efficiency, and complexity of implementation. And that's our basic, or the maybe the most important design principles for land. Choose a topology, choose a medium. If you have a shared medium, choose medium access control. And there are different selections you can make. The most common wired LAN is, uses a star topology, uses twisted pair copper wires, uh -huh. and with a star topology, we'll see shortly, it's not a shared medium, and therefore it doesn't need medium access control. So we'll s explain that shortly. It's not a shared medium. So we'll explain why that's the case, Be because before we said a star topology can be a shared medium. So we'll look at the, the technology for the most common wired LAN, which is created or standardized by the organization IEEE. They're an organization that creates standards for different technologies. The name of the standards that they create in terms of lands and metropolitan area networks is the 802 series. So they just give a number to the standards. And there's different standards within the 802 series. Standards for wired lands, their common names are Ethernet, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, using or different topologies we'll see shortly, a token ring based, a ring based LAN, which we saw in our example, they pass a token between the stations. Wireless LAN or Wi-Fi is fits within the 802 series of standards. So they create many different standards for different technologies. All of the 802 series of standards follow some common architecture. And it's shown here. Here's our five layer stack, our normal five layer stack. Yeah. The 802 standards focus on the bottom two layers, physical layer and data link layer. But in fact, they divide the data link layer into two sub layers. Logical link control, LLC, and medium access control. Medium access control is using the techniques we just spoke about sharing access between the different stations. Logical link control is about setting up the link, setting addresses. Uh, what else does it do? Sometimes sharing between the different standards. So within the 802 series, there are many different standards, and they give some other number for those standards. Wired lands. The Ethernet based wired LANs, the 802.3 standards. Wi Fi or wireless LAN, 802.11. A token ring based wired LAN, 802.5. WiMAX, another wireless, mainly for metropolitan area networks, 802.16. And they have others, 802.22 and so on. So they create standards in these general areas of LANs and metropol metropolitan area networks, wired and wireless. Maybe we need another volunteer. Okay, at the end you can be a volunteer. <laughs> if we get time. So we're going to focus just on the Ethernet based wired lands. But each of these follow this common architecture where they all use the same logical link control. There's a standard for how to control setting up links and assigning dresses and that's the 802.2 standard. So that's common amongst all of them. But then they have their individual MAC protocol and their individual physical layer protocol. So for example, 802.3 MAC protocol is different, sorry, 802.3 is different from 802.11 MAC protocol. 802.11 is wireless LAN. 802.3 is the wired LAN that we use on our desktop. They have different MAC protocols because they have different mediums. They have different physical layer. 
transmitting data on a wireless medium is much different than transmitting across twisted pair or optical fiber. So the technology for the physical layer differs across the different set of standards. Let's focus on this one, 802.3. This is just some examples of characteristics of a selection of them. Fast Ethernet allows us to go up to 100 megabits per second. It uses, it allows the use of different transmission media. Unshielded twisted pair, which is our copper wires twisted around. A shielded twisted pair where we add extra shielding to prevent from interference. It also allows to use optical fiber. We can use optical fiber in a wired LAN. It's just that we don't use it very often. It supports a medium access control method called CSMA CD. We're not going to go through how that works. It's just one of the MAC protocols. Wireless LAN, in fact, goes faster than 54 megabits per second today. Transmission media, it's wireless, tran transmitting at these frequencies. It uses the variation of the MAC protocol used in fast Ethernet. And the name is 802.11. And there are others. Let's focus on 802.3, Ethernet. This is the most widely used standard for any local area network. And it's used for wired LAN. Developed many years ago, 40 odd years ago, and has been standardized and improved over time. It started as an original, I think, one megabit per second data rate. And over the years, it's got faster and better. It's gone from what's originally called Ethernet. That was, I guess, the common name. The standard is 802.3, but the common name, Ethernet. And improved to fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, and there's even a 40 gigabit per second Ethernet and work on 100 gigabit per second Ethernet. Using similar concepts but improved technologies to send faster. Supports different transmission media. Supports twisted pair, both unshielded and shielded, coaxial cable and optical fiber. But some are more common than others. The original popular Ethernet was using a bus topology using coaxial cable and allowed a data rate of 10 megabits per second. So we had a bus, stations would connect to that bus and with a bus topology we have a shared medium. So that 10 megabit per second effectively is sh shared amongst those stations. Because it was a shared medium we needed medium access control and the name of the medium access control was CSMA, it was a random access approach. And it was half duplex. Most of these original Ethernet LANs have been replaced by fast Ethernet and gigabit Ethernet, but some are still around. Here's our bus. Our station's attached to that bus. In my example, just four stations. And each station can transmit onto the bus at 10 megabits per second. This is not really a link, it's a direct attachment to the bus, is one way to visualize that. Because it's a shared medium, then using a medium access control method, what how many people can transmit at a time? You are part of our net example <coughs> network. How many people could transmit at one time? One. one. That's the goal. One sends at a time. What's the average sending rate achievable for node A in this example? How fast can A send on average? 10 megabit per second when it's allowed to send, but sometimes it's not allowed to send. 
So on average, over over a period of one day, how fast can A send? 2.5 megabits per second. Let's calculate that. Let's say because they're allowed to send at 10 megabits per second, but only one station can transmit at a time, if we had round robin, we could A transmits, B, C, D, then A, B, C, D. Then let's say they get to transmit for one second, and then the next station for one second, and then the next one one second. So over time, A transmits for one second, so this is zero to one second. How much data does it transmit? <coughs> 10 megabits. If it can send at 10 megabits per second and it has the chance to transmit for one second, it could send 10 megabits. Let's just keep track of how much data A sends. It just sent 10 megabits in the first second. And now B transmits for a second. And then C, and then D, and now A transmits. And we can keep going doing that. Over a period of one day, each would get one quarter of the time to transmit. Or if we look over a period of four seconds, in this four seconds, a transmits 10 megabits of data. And then in the next four seconds, A would transmit another 10 megabits of data. And then in the next four seconds, another 10 meg megabits of data. And we could keep going forever. So A transmits 10 megabits of data every four seconds, which equals 2.5 megabits per second. 10 divided by four. That is, the average at which A can send is 2.5 megabits per second. And the same for C, A, uh, for B, C, and D. In other words, we share the capacity of our medium amongst the stations. If we have four stations, each station can get up to 2.5 megabits per second, on average. If we have 10 stations, each station gets one, one. one megabit per second. The more stations, the lower the per station sending rate. So if you add more stations to this LAN, the data rate at which those individual stations can send at, send at goes down. That's a problem with a shared medium. And it's present in all of the shared mediums, bus, uh, ring, wireless LAN, and so on. And it was the case in the original popular Ethernet. That, that was it, the more stations, the less your station gets. This is just summarizing some of the uh, technical characteristics of the 10 megabit per second physical layer. In fact, you could use coaxial cable, unshielded twisted pair, even optical fiber. But the most common was coaxial cable. Manchester, you remember Manchester encoding, or at least we mentioned it before the midterm. So these technologies are using some of the signal encoding techniques we introduced and talked about in before the midterm. And the most common was a bus topology using coaxial, coaxial cable. And in fact, each bus had some limit on the length of that bus. We have some endpoints, and how long can that cable go? Maximum length, 500 meters in one case. So that limits the deployment of the LAN across some place, because maybe to cover both of our buildings, we need more than 500 meters if we go along all the floors. So we need to have two different segments of our LAN and somehow join them together. And also a limit of number of nodes per segment. So they need to be taken into account when choosing the technology for a particular LAN. I think we just covered this here. On average, each station gets two and a half megabits per second. 
even though they can transmit at 10 megabits per second, at sometimes they're not transmitting anything. So they're transmitting at zero for some period of time. The next improvement from this bus topology, because using a bus is sometimes difficult because you need to run one cable past all computers in your, in your building. So the next improvement was to use a star topology where the central device is a hub. The, the name of the central device. Uh, so if B, C and D have no data to send, then A could be always sending at 10 megabits per second. So if B, C and D have nothing to send, then over a period of one day, A can get the full 10 megabits per second. But of course, they get zero. Even. So on average, we assume stations have some data to send. So if everyone has the same amount to send, we get the average of two and a half each. But of course, it depends on how much they want to send. That depends on the applications being used. A star topology where stations transmit to the central device, the hub, and what a hub does is takes the frame that is received and copies it and sends it to all the other output links. In this example, B transmits a frame to the hub. The hub receives it on one input link and transmits copies on the three other output links. So transmits a copy of that frame to A, to C, and to D. So a hub is very simple in that it just takes a frame on one link, send it on all other out, on all other links. As a result, if B is sending data to C, C will receive a copy of that frame. The frame will have a header saying the destination is C, so C will receive a copy and process that data. But A and D will also receive a copy, but they will notice that the header says C and they'll ignore the data, ignore that frame. Is it a, sh well, is it a shared medium? Yes. Why is it a shared medium? This is also a shared medium because if two stations transmit at a time, then again we can have collisions. So we use medium access control to make sure only one station transmits at a time. We draw our network. Then let's say B wants to transmit to C. It transmits the signal, the frame, which is just some signals transmitted to the hub. The hub just takes a copy of that and sends it on all of the output things. So transmitting to the hub and then the hub copies that and transmits to all the outputs. So it transmits the frame as a set of signals. If at the same time D wanted to send to A, then even if we, if we had a full duplex link here, D would be receiving a signal and could transmit a signal in the other direction, we'd have a collision on the output links. <coughs> that is, we'd have a collision here and here. That is, all right, B transmitted a signal and it was sent to all the output links. At the same time, D sent a signal to the hub and it was sent to all the output links you will see that on these two links, there's the signal coming from D and from B. And therefore we have a collision and 
neither A or C can understand what was transmitted. So using this topology, using a hub, it's still a shared medium. That is, we can still only allow one to send at a time. Otherwise, we'll get collisions. We could use some buffering in the hub. A, it makes the hub more complex, and still we can have collisions in the hub if the hub's not fast enough. So we use medium access control, and we only allow one station to transmit. As a result, even though our links are 10 megabits per second, the average per station is still 2.5 megabits per second. We share the 10 megabit per second amongst the four stations. So same performance as our bus topology. The advantage mainly is that it's easier to deploy in a particular in uh, buildings. It also has some fault tolerance, the, the star topology compared to the bus topology. Then there was an improvement made. And we m have the same topology, but the central device does something different. A hub sends to all output links. A switch sends to just one output link. Same topology. Same speed of links, 10 megabits per second. B wants to send to C. B sends a signal. I won't draw it as a signal. To make it a little bit easier, I'll send draw it as a frame, so some header and some data. And remember, in the header, we include the destination, C. So B sends a signal to the switch, which is, in fact, a frame. Included in the header is the destination, C. What the hub did... The hub is very simple. It's a dumb device. Wow, yeah. It receives, sends to every other link. It doesn't care who the destination is. A switch is a little bit smarter. It looks at the header, notices, OK, this frame needs to go to C, transmit just on that output link. Transmit to C. So transmit the frame to C in this direction. For this to work, the switch needs to know that station C is attached to this link and it needs to do some processing in the switch. That is, the device itself needs to be more complex than a hub and therefore is more expensive because it needs to look at the header and read the address and then know to transmit it on this link only. So the switch work in the uh, network layer? Uh, not, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's using the same concept that we use with our packet switches. What did a packet switch do? Receives a packet, sends it onto one of the output links. This is just a packet switch. It receives a packet, sends it onto one of the output links based upon the header. Uh, but a hub is, well, I think do not relate it to flooding. Send to all output links. Well, all right, yes. We broadcast, yeah. except on the link that we received it on. Uh, both, yeah, both cases we need a header. The hub needs a header, or the frame sent to the hub needs a header. Not for the hub, but for the destination. Because A, C and D receive this frame. A and D need to know to discard the frame, and C needs to know to accept the frame, because C is the destination. So they all need a header with a destination. It's just that the switch does something different here. So it's just routing the ball or not? 
Uh, yeah, similar. It's a very simple table in the switch. It says, okay, if we give this link or port number 1234, link 1234, if you saw on the switch that I passed around yesterday, there were numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They are the ports. Then 1 goes to A, 2 goes to B, 3 goes to C, and 4 goes to D. Where we addresses of these nodes, we'll see shortly the structure of these addresses. They are, in fact, 48-bit addresses. Switch receives a frame, looks at the frame header, sees the destination is C, C, send on link 3. Do not send to A or D. So when we pass up the service, the link, uh, the link, the link we collect the information about yeah. the place. Yeah. yeah, so compared to the hub, when we start up the switch, it needs to learn this no to know way. that C is on link 3. Match the name with the port. Yes, it needs to know the address, match this address C with, okay, is attached to port three, or link three. So that is something extra that the hub doesn't need to do. What speed can we get? What performance can we get now? Do we have collisions? Why not? In this case, B was sending to C. Let's do two more cases. Let's say A sends to A sends to D. So A transmits a frame to D. At the same time, then it's going to be received here. Just make the colors different. So here we have two stations transmitting. A is sending to D, and at the same time B is sending to C. No collision. No collision. If you look at the links, there's only one frame being transmitted at one time. So that can happen in parallel without collisions. What else can we do? If they are full duplex links, which really means we can transmit in one direction and in the opposite direction at the same time, as if we have two links, then we could do this. D could be sending to B. Because at the same time, it, this frame is going in one direction and D is sending in the other direction. That's possible on a full duplex link. And in twisted pair, all we do is we just have two different pairs. We have one pair of wires for one direction and another pair for the opposite direction. So we can transmit at the same time and they don't interfere with each other. And we can follow that through and we can see that on average everyone gets the full 10 megabits per second. Everyone can be transmitting at the same time. If, if D tries to send to, uh, to C, then there'll be a collision there. But what the switch can do is buffer that frame. But in the ideal case, everyone could be transmitting at the same time. A can be sending to D, B to C, D to A, and what's the last one? C. Uh, D to B and C to A. We have four stations transmitting at the same time. Or some other combination. Full duplex links. Our link rate is 10 megabits per second. Our per station data rate is the full 10 megabits per second. We don't need to share amongst the different stations. In fact, we don't need medium access control now. It's as if we have point-to-point -point links between, if, between the pairs of stations. 
So this is a significant performance improvement. We've gone from take the data rate, divide by the number of stations to the full data rate. If we had 100 stations, this would be 100, this would be 10 divided by 100, 0.1 megabit per second per station. Here, each station would get 10 megabits per second, 100 times improvement of performance. So moving from a bus or hub-based star topology to a switch-based star topology is much better for performance. The problem is that the switch needs to be more complex. It's more expensive to implement. But nowadays, the amount of expense to implement it is almost zero, compared to a hub, is almost zero. That is, you buy a hub, it may be 1,000 baht, you buy a switch, it's 1,001 baht. So, in effect, they're the same price because you buy you, that is, you cannot buy hubs now because they are all switches. In the past, there was a reasonable price difference between a hub and a switch. So it was more expensive to buy a switch. But nowadays, because of the, uh, the, the manufacturing is improved, it's so cheap, everyone just makes switches because they are much faster. Sorry? Uh, the, we, we call this a layer two or a level two switch because we said the 802 architecture focuses on the physical layer, level one or layer one, and the data link layer, layer two. We're just dealing with layer two communication. So this is a layer two switch. You'll hear about a layer three switch. We talk about a packet switch and when we talk about the internet protocol on the next topic, level three or layer three is the network layer switch. This is more like a router, and that's a different thing, but does the same procedure, same function, but operates on different layer of protocol. This is operating on Ethernet frames inside a LAN only. Hmm? Blame one of the students who set it to 22. Where'd he go? Someone, Someone come and set it before. He set it to 18. <laughs> Almost. Okay. Someone set it to 18 degrees at the start of the lecture. It was him. Blame him. <laughs> So nowadays, that's why most LANs use a star switch-based topology. Performance is much better than the others. Uh, the deployment of the network is easier than the others. So it's a good trade-off compared to the other alternatives. Some of the characteristics. So ne then we spoke about 10 megabits per second. That was Ethernet. Fast Ethernet improved the speed to 100 megabits per second, still using still allowed to use different media, but the most common LAN technology in use today is this 100 megabit per second fast Ethernet, star-based topology using switches. Again, you can use it using optical fiber, but the most common is using unshielded twisted pair. <coughs> Some different encoding. We didn't cover MLT3. No. This is the most common one. But the others are possible. This is 100, 100 megabits per second. It's called a 100 base something. I don't know what MLT stands for. You would need to look that up. It's a name of one of the encoding, signal encoding techniques. I don't remember what it is. Same as 4B, 5B is one of those signal encoding techniques that we didn't cover. And, now, and then there's an improvement from 100 megabits per second to one gigabit per second. Similar can work over different transmission media. And there are trade-offs in terms of distance. So gigabit Ethernet works over 
coaxial cable, unshielded twisted pair, as well as optical fiber, different types of optical fiber. And you can cover different distances, up to thousands of meters. So in fact, no, not just used for lands anymore. A five kilometer local area network is not very common, but you can use gigabit ethernet to connect uh, buildings together, say across a city, over up to several kilometers. Just some example topologies of, of combining your lands together. Here's an example where, for example, we have faculty members, the computers in their offices, maybe a printer and some server for the faculty members, all connected in a star topology to a switch. This is just representing a switch. And maybe you have staff in their own network, own physical network, or with their computers connected to a switch, and maybe different uh, departments of SIT, the different section of the staff in their network. And then those switches are connected to another switch, again in a star topology. So we can connect different segments of lands together because it depends upon the layout of the building. Maybe all of the computers in this building would connect to one switch and the other building another switch and then connect the two switches together to join those two lands. So we can join them in that way. So in fact, we could say all of this is the company or the organization land, the land for that organization. But it's in fact made up of multiple segments. Because remember when we talked about topologies, we said we could combine them together. We can combine star with a hub, star with a mesh, and so on. That's possible. Another example, maybe the only point here is that we can combine the technologies as well. We could be using 100 megabit per second links from our PCs to the first switch. So we call this a work group, say some com department of an organization. All their PCs connect via 100 megabit per second links. Same here. Then these switches, which need to carry the traffic from all of these users, so these users send data to this switch and then their data may go to this switch, maybe some servers or maybe to the users here. We can use a gigabit per second link here. So we can, our entire LAN can combine the different technologies. So this is just a switch, a switch and a switch and just using different technologies on the different links depending upon the requirements of how much data we need to transfer. And one more example there. So that's the, a brief introduction to the typical Ethernet based LANs, 802.3 based LANs. Last thing we want to cover, and we do it reasonably quickly, is addresses and frame structures. What is, what is this frame look like? I drew it as just some header and some data and some address in there. What is the structure of that address? What is the structure of that frame? That's what we're going to cover here. This shows the structure of the frame with respect to the different layers as an example. Remember what we do at the top layer, our application creates data send to the next layer, so the transport layer, the protocol at transport layer adds a header, sends it to the next layer, and so on. In this example, we have application data, send it to the transport layer, we're using a particular protocol, TTP, adds a header, send it to the next layer, adds a header, and then we get to our data link layer, which is here, and within the 802 series, remember the data link layer has two sub-layers. Logical link control, MAC. So we split it into two. And that's where we see we have a logical link control header. And then we can have a, we have a separate MAC header. So 
And in fact, the Mac layer also adds something at the end, a trailer. I didn't draw that on these packets, but in fact, there's something at the start of the packet, at the frame, and at the end as well, a header and a trailer. So this is our entire Mac frame. Inside that is a LLC, they call it a protocol data unit, a packet or a frame. And inside that is an IP datagram, inside that TCP segment. Inside the TCP segment, our original data from the application. What's the structure of this Mac frame? That's what we want to look at. This is the Mac frame at the top. It contains some control information, which is really used to indicate the start of the frame. We'll see the exact structure. A destination address. Who, is we, who are we sending this frame to? A source address. Who is sending the frame? The logical link control protocol data unit. And the structure of that is shown here. But in fact, most of our LANs used today, the logical link control, we don't need all of this. We only need just one field, which we'll show shortly. So in fact, we're not going to go through all of these parts. Logical link control is, can be used, but in most networks today, when we use the internet protocol, we replace all of these with just one two-byte field, one two-byte value which indicates what's inside this frame. What is inside our LLC protocol data unit? What is inside it? No, inside, so an IP datagram. So we say inside our LLC protocol data unit is an IP datagram. So in most Mac frames, instead of including this detailed LLC header, we just you include one two-byte value which says that the type of the data inside this Ethernet frame, the Ether type, is an IP frame. So there's a two-byte value which says that this is an IP frame. We'll see that structure in a moment. And at the end, we include a checksum for error detection. Remember when we talked about parity bits for error detection? We mentioned CRC is an error detection algorithm. Well, CRC is used here so that when the receiver receives this frame, they can detect are there any errors in the data. If they detect errors, then they know that there's something that's gone wrong and they can ask the source to retransmit. So the CRC is used for error detection. It's the trailer of the frame. This, not all of it, but if you look at the frame part of it, from the destination address, source address, the type, the data, and the frame check sequence, that's our Mac frame. Well, that's a part of interest to us. The rest really, the preamble and the start, is really part of the physical layer. So if we draw that Mac frame, and it's the most common thing you'll see when you, for example, start to look at individual frames in a network, this is what you'll see, especially next semester in our lab. We can draw the Mac frame like this. Destination address, source address, uh, the, the type, the data, and the checksum. It's called a frame check sequence. In the previous slide, it was the CRC. But in general, it's a checksum, or for error detection. This is our, this is the packet from the higher layer. The type is the two byte uh, field which replaces the entire LLC header. Just to keep it simple, we don't need to include everything from the LL logical link control header. We just include this two-byte value. 
An octet, in our case, an octet is eight bits. When we say a byte, we say we mean it eight bits. So here, one octet is one byte. In real life, then a byte may be may not be eight bits. So that adds confusion. Some bytes in the past were seven bits. So that don't don't remember that. One byte, eight bits. One octet, eight bits. So you can replace octet with byte here. So our destination address is six bytes. Source address, six bytes. Type field is two bytes. CRC checksum is four bytes at the end. And our data can be varying in size. And it goes up to normally a maximum of 1,500 bytes. There are some extensions to make it larger, but that's the most typical maximum value. It can be less. So that's our max frame. And in fact, when we look in the lab next semester, you'll see these MAC frames quite common, <laughs> this, this particular structure. The last thing is, so the type field indicates what's in here. If it's an IP datagram, which it commonly is when we're using the internet, using IP software, then the type just has some number that indicates an IP datagram. Anyone remember the number? I cannot remember. It's, uh, I can, there's some number to indicate an IP datagram. If it's some other type of data, not an IP datagram, there's another number. Okay. You'll discover the number another time. Check sum for error detection. Destination and source addresses. What's the structure of those addresses? Well, we've talked about them before. They are 48-bit addresses. The IEEE 48-bit addresses that uh, we talked about in one of our first lectures when we mentioned addressing. These are MAC addresses or hardware addresses. These are the addresses assigned to your LAN card, your network interface card. 48 bits or 6 bytes. Most often they're not written as 48 bits. To make it a little bit easier, we convert them into hexadecimal and we get 12 hexadecimal digits. One hexadecimal digit, four bits, 12 hexadecimal digits. And we usually group them in pairs of two hexadecimal digits. They have some structure. The first, so the goal of a MAC address is to be globally unique. Every device, every LAN card, including wireless LAN cards, should have a unique MAC address. And how we achieve that is that the manufacturers are assigned a special code which is used for the first 24 bits. So every manufacturer of LAN cards gets an assignment of a sequence of 24 bits and they use that for all the LAN cards that they manufacture for the first 24 bits. The last 24 bits are assigned by the manufacturer to that device. So all the devices from company A have the same first 24 bits, but they have a different last 24 bits. As a result, they should be globally unique, as long as the manufacturer assigns them correctly. In practice, that's not always true, because nowadays you can pre-program, or you can reprogram the, the address on devices. So I can change my address to be the same as yours, and therefore they're not globally unique. But when they're manufactured, they're very close to globally unique addresses. You can change by... You can change them. Or yeah. These addresses are used not just in wired LANs, but all, all the other 802 standards, wireless LANs, and even in other standards. So they're a very common address format. In fact, there's another one, a 64-bit address format, which is different again. But perhaps the most common data link layer hardware address format is this 48-bit address format. You'll see it very common in different standards. There's your task. Find your 48-bit address. And just quickly, I'll demonstrate it on my computer. ifconfig.
if I can spell. spell. I've got two interfaces. My wired LAN interface. Here it is, the MAC address. 48 bits, but expressed as 12 hexadecimal digits. So you can convert it back to the real 48-bit address. The first six digits there indicate the manufacturer of my device. 002454. And in fact, <laughs> there's a website provided by IEEE that maps that lists those manufacturers. Mine was 0, 0, 0024. Now we're too hot. Now my internet access is there. So this website just lists the manufacturer of that land card. Sometimes the company is obvious. Sometimes it's because the land cards are outsourced to different manufacturers. You may not notice who, who it is. So each six, so the first 24 bits or the first six hexadecimal digits identify the manufacturer. The last are assigned by that manufacturer. And I also have a wireless LAN card in my laptop. Here's the address. And it's manufactured by someone else. 00265E indicates a different manufacturer. What is it? 00265E. high precision they make a lot of the a lot of networking and, and laptop equipment I think on high. so almost well, m many different standards use this same format of address it's a very common format of address and when the MAC frame is sent the destination address is the address of the station we're sending to. The source is the station that sent that frame. Finishes for today. You can go home and find your address on your laptop, on your mobile phone. In some phones, you'll find it on your phone. In Windows, IP config will find it. In a Mac, IF config, I think, or simply IP.